go ahead and get started. All right, this is College Algebra. This is November the 8th, so a couple of things I need to talk to you guys about. And uh, first thing is WebAssign homework. So let's you know pay attention to WebAssign homework and don't get behind on that. Uh, you have uh, some homework that's due 3, 4, and 3, 7 on composition and inverse functions, and that's due today. So by the end of the day today, I need that finished up. Uh, the next due date is for sections 6, 3, 6, 4, and 6, 5, and that's in a little bit less than two weeks from today, so 11, 21. So that's the week of Thanksgiving, actually. So, um, so try to work on that and get, get working on exponential and logarithm homework. Exam 2 grades, uh, I've posted those. I've, e I've sent an email out to everybody about it, but let me remind you again that I've posted those Exam 2 grades. They're posted on your WebAssign gradebook, and this is kind of the uh, order to take to, um, to access your grades on your WebAssign gradebook. Go to your WebAssign homepage, click on Grades, which is in the upper left-hand corner, kind of upper left-hand part of, your, of the screen. Then click on Raw Scores, which is in the middle of the screen, and then Exams after that. You should be able to see all your exam grades. Remember, you can get a copy of your graded exam sent back to you by email. You just need to email email me a request, and I will certainly respond back to that email with an attachment for your exam. Uh, Doug asked me a few minutes ago about this, but if you didn't get your exam one grade uh, graded exam back and you want that one also, you know I don't. That's not a problem to send all of them back. It's just an attachment to an email. So uh, so tell me. You know, email me what you need me to send back to you, and I'll send it back to you. That's not a problem. I'll probably start doing that tomorrow sometime. I'm still finishing up some calculus grades, um, and so when I get those done, then I'm going to uh, start emailing graded exams back to people. Uh, let's see. Um, and then today, <clears throat> we're going to cover exponential function homework, which I've, I've kind of put up a couple different times, and I'm going to actually go through all that homework and make sure that there's no questions there. And then we're going to go back and kind of review and recall some stuff from last time that we talked about on logarithms. And then the uh, new things that we're going to do today, we're going to talk about properties of logarithms. So that's kind of where we're headed here. <clears throat> All right, so if there's no questions from anybody that's online, um, I do, you know, some of this you're going to need a calculator for, by the way. So uh, you know, you either use your cell phone as a calculator or, or actually use a graphing calculator to do your homework. Uh, and you're going to need a graphing calculator or some kind of calculator for sure on a, this next exam as well, because there's some calculations you're going to have to do with logarithms where you're going to need a calculator. So, all right. So let's get started. Uh, this was the exponential function homework. And so I actually want to, I've, I've put this up several times now. Um, in notes and, and attached it as a separate file in my Google site. Uh, I didn't really assign any exponential function homework out of WebAssign. They didn't really like the problems that were in there. And so this, these problems are a good review of what you're going to see on the exam for exponential functions also. So, um, so I actually want to go through and work these problems now so that you actually have solutions to these worked out. One thing I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to graph an exponential function by plotting points, creating a t-table of values, picking x values, and actually creating some points to actually sketch a graph. So uh, we have the exponential function 4 to the x. And so when x is negative 2, you have 4 to the negative 2, which is 1 over 16. Remember that a negative exponent flips the constant, ch changes it into a fraction, and um, so it does not make it a negative number, remember. Uh, when x is negative 1, you have 4 to the negative 1, which is 1 fourth. When x is 0, you have 4 to the 0, and remember that's 1. When x is 1, you get 4 to the 1st, which is 4. And when x is 2, you get 4 to the 2nd, which is 16. So then, you know, now you've got a nice, decent group of points. Go ahead and use those to sketch the graph. <clears throat> so I have 0, 1 right here. And then 1, 4 is right here. Uh, 2, 16 is off the, uh, the top of the screen, so I really can't use that point. 
Uh, negative 1, 1 fourth is way down here like this. And then negative 2, 1 16th is so close to the x-axis, it's really difficult to even picture that. So, All right, so then you get this graph like this. And remember that this function, this shape function, is called a growth curve right here. When you have a rising exponential graph like this, this is called a growth curve. <clears throat> I also want to point out that remember that the domain for these exponential functions is all reals. They're defined everywhere. But the range is not all reals, right? Because there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. In other words, the x-axis. And so the graph just gets really close to the x-axis, but never actually gets to the x-axis. And so the range is 0 to infinity, and there's a parenthesis around the 0. Uh, because it doesn't actually ever get to 0, right? All right, so that's our, a very typical growth curve right there. All right, the, uh, the next problem, uh, we have uh, 2 thirds to the x. So when x is negative 2, remember that that flips the fraction. So you, you flip it and you get 3 halves to the positive 2, which is 9 fourths. Right? You flip it and then square it. And so when you square 3 halves, you get 9 fourths. When x is negative 1, you have 2 thirds to the negative 1. That just flips it. You get 3 halves. When x is 0, you get um, 2 two thirds to the 0. And remember, anything to the 0 power is 1. When x is 1, you have 2 thirds to the 1, which is 2 thirds. And when x is 2, finally, you have 2 thirds to the second power, which is 4 ninths. All right, so uh, you plot these points. When x is negative 2, you get 9 fourths. And remember that. So you're looking at the point negative 2, 9 fourths. If you're having trouble locating where 9 fourths is on the graph, then write it as a mixed number. 9 fourths is really the same thing as 2 and a fourth. And so that gives us a, a better idea of where that point's located, right about there. When x is negative 1, you get 3 halves, which is 1 and a half. When x is 0, you get 1. And then when x is 1, you get 2 thirds, maybe right about there. And then four ninths like that. And so you get a graph that's the same basic shape as the problem we just talked about. But in this case, this is a falling graph. And so this one, remember that the, the, the general name for this kind of graph is a decay curve. Right? So if the graph is rising, it's a growth curve. If the graph is falling, it's a decay curve for exponential functions like this. The domain is still all reals. The exponential functions domains are always going to be all reals. And the range, like the problem above it, 0 to infinity, again, there's a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis. All right, and so there's our graph. Uh, I will definitely ask you to do this on the exam in a couple of weeks. Uh, I will definitely ask you to sketch some exponential functions simply by plotting points, creating a table of values and plotting points. All right, the next two problems are compound interest problems. I'll ask you a compound interest problem or two. Remember that these formulas for compound interest are formulas that I'm going to supply to you. You're not going to need to memorize those at all. This first compound interest formula is the one that you use when the interest is compounded a finite number of times a year. In this case, the interest is compounded uh, quarterly, and so that would mean that n would be equal to 4. And r is the interest rate. That's 3%. You don't write it as a percent. You write it as a decimal, and so that would be 0 0.03. t, it says, how much do I have after 10 years? t would be 10. And then the principal, the amount you're investing here is $1,000. And so you're, you're substituting those, those pieces of information in. And when it says, how much do I have after 10 years, that how much means you're after A, right? A is the amount you have after uh, 10 years or T years. All right, so you substitute this information into the formula. So you have A equals P, which is 1,000, times 1 plus 0 0.03 divided by 4 raised to the nt power. So that would be 4 times 10 power. 
right? You're compounding the interest four times a year for 10 years. That means you're compounding it 40 times altogether. And that's where that four times 10 comes from. And now you do the arithmetic here, and I want to uh, make sure that I don't make any mistakes here. But uh, so let's see, you get A is equal to 1,000 plus 0 0.0075, that's 0 0.03 divided by 4, all raised to the 40th power. So our, our uh, amount here is going to be, and I think I, um, yeah, I wrote that incorrectly. I'm not really sure why I wrote that like that. Let me rewrite that again. Try it one more time. This is 1,000, that's better, times 1 plus 0 0.0075 to the 40th power. That's better. So that's 1,000 times 1 1.0075 to the 40th. And then remember that the uh, 1.0075 to the 40th, you enter that as 1.0075 and then use the caret symbol for the exponent like that. So, uh, and that would definitely be a, a calculator question. And when I do that calculation on my calculator, I get about 1.3483. So you have A is equal to 1,000 times 1.3483, that's just an approximation for, to four decimal places, and then you multiply that finally by 1,000, and so you get $1,348 and about 35 cents, rounding it. And so that's how much we would have in our account after 10 years. We started with $1,000, and after 10 years, we'd have $1,348 dollars and 35 cents approximately all right okay so that's our that's a compound interest formula where we're compounding a finite number of times a year uh, the next problem this is the other compound interest formula you use this when you're compounding interest continuously and this is our continuous compound interest formula and again that's a problem uh, or a formula where I would give you the formula so here the amount, or I'm sorry, the uh, principal is $1,000, so P is 1,000. Uh, R, in this case, 0 0.04, and T, in this case, would be 10. Uh, remember, E is a constant. E is approximately equal to 2.718. You don't need to use 2.718 in the calculation because you have a, an exponentiation key for E on your calculator. So you don't need to enter 2.718 necessarily, but I definitely want you to know that that's what E is equal to. So when you substitute into this formula, you have A equals 1,000 times E raised to the 0 0.04 times 10 power. And uh, so you'd have A is equal to 1,000 times E to the 0.4 power, like that. And so remember, e to the 0.4 power on your calculator, you hit the second key, and then you hit the ln key. And when you enter the second key and the ln key, that brings up e raised to, and then a, parenth a left parenthesis like that. And then you enter the power, and then um, you can finish up the calculation there. So you hit the second ln key, I enter it, uh, e to the 0.4 power, and I get 1.4918 approximately. So I get A is equal to 1,000 times 1.4918. And so when you multiply by 1,000, then you uh, get $1,491 and about 82 cents actually is a rounded value. And so that would be our amount. Okay, so after 10 years, 4% get $1,491.82. All right, so I'm going to ask you a very basic compound interest problem like that. Now, uh, then we went on and we started looking at graphs for, in particular, for the function e to the x. Remember, again, where e is 2.718. Uh, I will ask you to give me the graph for e to the x probably on exam three, but then I'll also ask you some transformations for that. For that function. So uh, now, and that was what the rest of this homework was about, was just transformations of e to the x. 
So the first one, e to the x plus 2, when you enter, when you add 2 to a function, right, you are shifting the graph up two units. So now I've already graphed e to the x on the uh, coordinate system there. And so we're just shifting this graph up two units. Uh, what that means is that the horizontal asymptote, which is on the x-axis, gets shifted up two units. Remember that on e to the x, any vertical shift of the graph, if you're moving it up or down, you're going to get the horizontal asymptote to move up or down also. And you need to sketch in the new horizontal asymptote. So that's a, that's a requirement. You've got to do that. Uh, and then you're just shifting the graph up two units. So you could just literally count up two for both of those points. And here's your graph. Without that horizontal asymptote, you're not sure uh, how to sketch the graph. And, and I get a lot of people who will sketch it and then have it, have it actually cross the horizontal asymptote, which I don't want you to do. So, all right, so there's e to the x plus 2. The next graph, e to the x plus 3, now notice the plus 3 is in the exponent. It's not, you're not adding it to e to the x, you're adding it to the x. And so this is a shift to the left 3, right? Because you're, you're messing with the x value here. So the horizontal asymptote does not shift here, and you're simply moving this graph to the left 3 units, and here's your new graph right here. Right. Notice in each case for these points, I am just literally counting back three units in both cases, right, like this. And when you shift back three like that, then you're getting the new graph. And so there's e to the x plus three, like that. Remember, when you're adding the constant to the function, then you're shifting up or down because you're adding to the y value. When you're adding it to the x, then you're moving left or right. All right. All right, and then the, uh, the next problem is so we have three more transformations here, and this was the homework. The next problem, this one is right to, this is a combination of the last two, and then down three. All right, so since it's a shift down three, that means that the horizontal asymptote gets shifted down three. And so here's the horizontal asymptote down here at y equals negative 3. And then the, sh the graph is shifted down 3, and it's shifted to the right 2. So, you know, if you want to, you could, you could first shift it to the right 2. Here's my shift to the right 2, like that. That's e to the x minus 2. And then finally shift that graph down 3, and here's our final graph right here. All right, so we first shifted to the right, and then we shifted down. And you can see just on the point zero, 0,1, if you want to look at that, here's your shift to the right. Here's your shift down like that. All right, right three and, uh, sorry, right to 2 and down 3. Please sketch in the horizontal asymptote. Also, if you were asked for the domain and range on a problem like this, the domain, again, is all reals. And the range, in this case, would be from negative 3 to infinity, right? Because the horizontal asymptote has been shifted down to negative 3. All right, uh, then the next transformation, you have a negative sign in front of the e to the x. And you have a negative sign in front of a function. Remember, negative f of x like this. This is a reflection, and it's a reflection around the x-axis. And so you're literally just turning this graph upside down. And so when you turn this graph upside down, when you reflect around the x-axis, you get this graph, this graph here, not a growth or a decay curve. Right, it's just the growth curve reflected around the x-axis. Like that. And then finally, e to the negative x, when you, when you have a, a f of negative x like this, in other words, you stick a negative sign in front of the x, in this case, you're reflecting reflection around the y-axis. And so you're literally just flipping the graph right and, uh, right and left. And so this graph uh, looks like this. Right? And there's the graph of e to the negative x. So these are the things uh, that I'm going to ask you about exponential functions that this homework goes over. And I want, that's why I wanted to kind of go back over that again and uh, go over all that homework with you and make sure that you are clear on those things. Those are the kinds of questions I'll ask you in exponential functions in particular, 
on exam three. So those 10 problems are a pretty good review of what you're going to see on exam three. All right, so then uh, what we did is we made a shift uh, after we talked about exponential functions because we encountered a problem, if you recall, uh, from the last exam where we were trying to solve for a variable in the exponent. Um, we had a compound interest problem where we were trying to find the t value and so, you know, uh, we were trying to create a situation where we could actually solve for the t value. And so we came up with some stuff for uh, some basic things with logarithms. And we introduced this new notation uh, called logarithm notation. And it was a way of taking an exponential expression, y equals b raised to the uh, x power, and rewrite it so that we solve for the exponent. And, and to solve for the exponent, we would write this as uh, logarithm base b of y equals x, like that. And remember that the logarithm is always equal to the exponent. So notice on, on the exponential form, the exponent is x. right? And so notice that's what the logarithm is equal to, a logarithm is always equal to the exponent. So a logarithm is just another way of writing an exponent, basically. And so a lot of the properties of exponents are going to, are going to extend over into logarithms, because logarithms really are just another way of writing an exponent. Uh, remember that this is called the log form right here. Um, well, definitely not. This is called the exponential form right here. This is the exponential form. And this is the, the uh, log form up here, All right? And so we talked about converting back and forth between log form and exponential form. So um, some examples of that. So converting, right? So if we went from exponential form, and th this would be something I would ask you to do on a test, definitely. So from exponential form to log form, Right, so if we had 3 to the x plus 4 equals 500, let's say. 3 to the x plus 4 equals 500. That's an example of an exponential form. So to write that in logarithm form, what would we do? We would write logarithm base. And remember, the base on the logarithm is the same as the base on the exponential expression. Right, up, up in, the, uh, in the statement I have up here, notice the base on the logarithm is b and the base on the exponential expression is b. They're always the same. So this is going to be a logarithm base 3 of 500 equals x plus 4. Remember, the logarithm is always equal to the exponent. And so that would be the log form in this case. You have an exponential form, and we wrote it in its corresponding log form. All right, so that's one thing we talked about last time. And then the other, the, another thing we talked about is going from log form to exponential form. Right? You have to be able to go both directions with these kinds of problems. So log form, like for example, if we had logarithm base 6 of x plus 5 equals, let's say, uh, z. Logarithm base 6 of x plus 5 equals z. So that would be a typical log form. And then to write that in exponential form, Remember that the bases have to be the same, so the base on the exponential form is 6. Remember the logarithm is equal to the exponent, so this would be, z would have to be the exponent, so it would be 6 to the z equals x plus 5. And that would be the corresponding exponential form. You've got to be able to go back and forth between logarithm form and exponential form. So that's one thing we've talked about uh, learned, uh, figuring out how to do. Uh, next thing we talked about, uh, we talked about that there were two uh, bases that were more important maybe than others that we use abbreviations for. So we have base 10 logs, remember, are called common logs. And the abbreviation for a common log is just log x. Right? When you write a logarithm without a base written down, then the base is understood to be 10. And so this is really... Log, a shorthand version of logarithm base 10 of x. 
you have a log key on your calculator. And when you see the log key on your calculator, there's no base written there. That's understood to be a base 10 logarithm key. <clears throat> and then we also have uh, base E logarithms. Base E logarithms are called natural logs. And the abbreviation for a natural log is LNX, like that. When you write LNX, that's a logarithm. Even though you don't see the word log written down, that's a logarithm. It's just a logarithm base E. And you can always rewrite it that way if you get confused. You can write it as log base E of X, like that. All right, so we talked about uh, natural logs and common logs. <clears throat> we also talked about, uh, so um, we did some calculating. Now that we've mentioned that, uh, so calculating uh, without a calculator. In other words, just using what you know about logarithms to ca uh, actually calculate some values. So for example, logarithm base 2 of 8. Remember, this represents, I mean, we talked about this in words, this represents, it's an exponent. And remember, this is the exponent or the power you raise 2 to get 8. And so logarithm base 2 of 8 is equal to 3 because it would be 2 to the third has got to be equal to 8. Right? Well, notice the logarithm is equal to the exponent. And what's the exponent? It's the exponent you would raise the base to get the number you're taking the log of there. Log base 2 of 8 is equal to 3. Log base um, whoops. Log base 5 of 25, that would be the power you raise 5 to get 25. And so logarithm base 5 of 25 is equal to 2 because 5 to the second power is equal to 25. All right. Um, log of 1,000. All right, so notice the base is not written down here, so this is understood to be base 10. And so this is the power you raise 10 to get 1,000. And so that would be equal to 3. And, and why? Because 10 to the third power is equal to 1,000. Natural log of e to the fifth power. I'm, um, whoops, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to write. Yeah, absolutely. So natural log of e to the fifth power. <clears throat> so this is the power, right? What's the base on this logarithm? The base on this logarithm is e. It's not the e that's written there. It's, it, remember, this is an abbreviation. And so this is the power you raise e to get e to the fifth power, right? This is what you're taking the log of right here, is e to the fifth power. And so it's the power you raise e to get e to the fifth power. Well, and if you think about that, that's got to be equal to 5, right? What's, what's the power you raise e so that you get e to the fifth power? Well, that would be 5 right there. <clears throat> and in fact, that's always true, isn't it, that the natural log of e to the x power, whatever that exponent is right there, this is always going to be equal to x. And uh, you know that last property kind of uh, led us into the idea that uh, logarithm functions and exponential functions were inverses of each other. Right. So uh, that was another idea that we talked about. We talked about a, little, a lot of little basic ideas about logarithms last time, and this is another big one. Was um, Logarithm and exponential functions are inverses of each other. All right, so for example, if you have the function f of x is log x, that's log base 10, remember, that its inverse function its inverse function is the exponential function 10 to the x. <clears throat> right? And so, you know, you get these inverse cancellation properties for those two functions. 
Remember, the inverse cancellation means that when you apply both of those kind of in sequence to an x value, it's like you're not doing anything at all. So if you have 10 raised to the log x power, notice that the base on the exponential expression is 10, and the base on the logarithm expression is 10 also. So they're the same, they're, they're inverses of each other because they have the same base. And so that would be equal to x. And the same thing the other direction, if you have log, again, this is log base 10, of 10 to the x. So the base on the logarithm is 10. The base on the exponential ex expression is 10. They cancel each other out, and you're left with x. So you have those two properties um, for base 10 logarithms. <clears throat> and then this extends over to the natural log and the exponential function e to the x. That if alpha of x is ln x, then its inverse is e to the x. And so the inverse cancellation properties for these, again, if that means if you apply e to the x and natural log of x in sequence on, to an x value, it's like you're not doing anything at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you have uh, e raised to the natural log of x power, Okay, so notice that the exponential expression's base is e. That's the number I'm raising to a power. That's e. And then the base on the logarithm is e. So they're the same. And so it's, if you have this inverse cancellation property. They, they cancel each other out. And uh, then you also get um, that reverse in the other direction. That if you have the natural log of e to the x, that that's also x, right? That the bases, again, on the logarithm and the exponential expression were the same. So... <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, this kind of led us into talking about graphs and domains of logarithm functions. And that's kind of where we finished last time. So I want to um, kind of proceed on in the next page here. So if you have f of x equals e to the x, we know its inverse is ln x. Remember that e to the x and ln x are inverses of each other. And by the way, on your calculator, uh, I don't know if you've noticed that, but your calculator actually tells you that those are inverses if you look at the screen or the, uh, the keyboard on your calculator. If you look at the keyboard, uh, you'll have an LN key, right? That's our, that's our key right there. And then right above that in kind of like a gold color, so I won't put it that, I'll just put it in a different color right here. You have E to the X right there. And so remember how you get to that e to the x is you hit second ln, and that second's really an inverse key. And so it, they're actually telling you that e to the x and ln x are inverses of each other. And then the same thing is true for the log key, which is right above the ln key on most calculators. And the log key, so the log key is sitting right here. It just says log, and that means it's log base 10. And sure enough, sitting above the log key is 10 to the x. So your calculator is actually telling you that those uh, that the 10 to the x and log x are inverses and that e to the x and ln x are inverses of each other. It's actually sitting there on your keyboard. All right, so if we go to the sketch here for the graphs, so we have e to the x uh, goes through we know goes through 0, 1, and 1e. E. Here's e to the x, our growth curve. So its inverse would have to just take those two points and flip them. So you, instead of 0, 1, you get 1, 0. And instead of 1e, uh, e, you get e1. This is the point e1. Remember, e is about 2.718. And so you get this graph, which is the graph of ln x. Remember that these have to be symmetric around the line y equals x because they're inverses, and sure enough, that's true. Right? When you draw that uh, line y equals x in there, you get that they're um, symmetric around that line. So what about the domain and range for e to the x? Well, we know we've written that down several times already today. Right? The domain's all reals. The range is 0 to infinity, and there's a horizontal asymptote, 
at y equals zero on the x-axis. So what happens? All that flips around for the logarithm, doesn't it? So the uh, whoops, the uh, domain on the logarithm is the is what the range was on the exponential function. So that's zero to infinity. And the range in this case is negative infinity to infinity. And this graph has a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. In other words, the y-axis is the vertical asymptote for the logarithm. <clears throat> so it's important to understand that exponential functions have, have horizontal asymptotes, logarithms have vertical asymptotes. And in particular then, uh, you know, what that graph is telling you there is because the graph never goes on uh, onto the uh, negative side of the y-axis, right, that, that when you're taking the log of something, it does, and by the way, it doesn't matter what base logarithm that you're talking about, and we started talking about this last time, that if you have logarithm base b, who cares what the base is of some expression right here, we'll call this Bob right here. So if you have the logarithm base b of Bob, First of all, the base has always got to be positive. We know that, but Bob has always got to be positive also. Bob has to be greater than zero. There's no way you can get a negative Bob value there, and so that you can never take the log of a negative number. <clears throat> and so that allows you to be able to take or to find uh, domains for logarithm functions pretty easily, if you keep that in mind, for basic logarithm functions at least. Um, and that's, that's all we're going to be looking at here. So uh, if you have f of x is uh, log of 3x minus 5, that's a base 10 logarithm, but we don't even care that it's a base 10 logarithm. No matter what the base is, what has got to be true here? That 3x minus 5 has got to be greater than 0. And so you get that 3x has got to be greater than 5, and x has got to be greater than 5 thirds. And that's the domain for this function. That's the set of x values you can use for this function, or x values greater than 5 thirds. And so in interval notation, that would be from 0 to 5 thirds. What that means about the graph, by the way, is that uh, on the graph, at 5 thirds, which is right here on the x-axis, right about there, 1 and 2 thirds, you get a vertical asymptote at x equals 5 thirds. And this graph is, you know, its basic shape kind of looks like this, right? It's going to, you're going to get a logarithm shape like that hitting up against that, that uh, vertical asymptote. <clears throat> all right. Um, all right, we're doing good here. We're, we're going over and kind of trying to piece some things together from last time. And um, so one more problem like this, and then... Um, and then we'll be finished with uh, that, going back over that stuff, and then we can move into the um, uh, properties of logarithms that we need to talk about today. So here you have f of x is the natural log of 2x plus 7. If we we're going to try to find the domain on this one, again, it's a logarithm. In this case, it's a logarithm base e, right? Remember, that's what the natural log is the shorthand for, is base e. Uh, that doesn't matter as far as finding the domain. What we, all we care about is the fact that you you can only take logs of positive numbers, and so 2x plus 7 must be greater than 0. And so if that's true, then 2x is greater than negative 7, and x is greater than negative 7 halves. And so that would be our domain in this case, is all the x values. Those are the x values we can use in this function would be everything from negative 7 halves on. On the graph, what that implies about this natural log is that at negative 7 halves, which is negative 3 and a half, uh, which is right about here, right there's x equals negative 7 halves, that you get a graph for this logarithm that is going to look sort of like this, right? It's going to um, go up against that vertical asymptote there at negative 7 halves. <clears throat> All right. So uh, that kind of runs through everything we've talked about last time as far as, um, as, far as uh, the basic stuff having to do with logarithms. So really kind of a, a, 
a quick rundown of all the basic highlights of things that we've discussed last time. So today what we want to do is we want to look at uh, section, so we covered sec basically section 6.3 and 6.4, and so six, section 6.5 in your textbook is on properties of logarithms. Uh, some more advanced properties of logarithms, I guess, is probably the way you, uh, I might want to say this. So, so, so far, the, the properties we have, if you kind of want to summarize that, you know, you've got the property that allows you to convert back and forth between logarithm form and exponential form, first of all. You've got that if uh, f of x is b to the x, then the inverse of that function is logarithm base b of x, right? That uh, exponential functions and logarithm functions are inverses of each other. <clears throat> so special cases of that are that if f of x is 10 to the x, then f inverse is log x, log base 10. We just wrote this on the last page or two. And that if f of x is e to the x, that exponential function, that its inverse is ln x. And remember, ln x is just an abbreviation for log base e. Uh, we also have properties kind of like this that we stated last time. Also, that logarithm base b of 1 is always equal to 0. In other words, no matter what the base on the logarithm is, um, if you take the log of 1, you always get 0. So in particular, that meant that um, log of 1, log base 10, in other words, is 0, right? And natural log of 1 is equal to 0, right? When it, no matter what the base is on a logarithm, you always get a 0. If you take the log of 1, you always get 0. And if um, you take log base b of b, that's always equal to 1, right? It's the power you raise b to get b, so you always get 1. And so the specific examples of that would be uh, log base 10. So log of 10 is 1. So that's logarithm base 10 of 10. And the natural log of e is equal to 1, because that's the logarithm base e of 1. So if the base uh, yeah, of the logarithm and the number you're taking the log of are always um, are the same, then you always get one as the answer, because that's just relying on, on exponent properties there. <clears throat> and then finally, we had inverse cancellation. Uh, and we've already stated those properties, but let me just kind of state it again in general here. So with inverse cancellation, right, we get that b raised to the log base b of x is equal to x, right? We talked about that with uh, base b, base e and base 10 logarithms. And we also get log base b of um, of uh, b to the x, I'll get it right here in a minute, of uh, b to the x is equal to x also. Right, so if the base on the exponential expression and the base on the logarithm expression are the same, then you um, get x, right? Did you get inverse cancellation there? All right, so those are the properties we've discussed so far. So we have some other properties that we need to discuss here. First of all, uh, property using your calculator. So using calculators here. Uh, your calculator only speaks, put that in quotes there, speaks in base 10 uh, and base e. So if you want to calculate a base e or a base 10 uh, logarithm on your calculator, you can do that uh, directly. So for example, if I, just if I was just looking at uh, log of 75, log of 75. So remember, that's a base 10 logarithm. This is the power, in, in words, this is the power you raise 10 to get 75. But I don't know what that is. Um, 
what is the power you raise 10 to get 75, right? But on your calculator, you can, you can evaluate that, right? Your calculator will actually do that because it speaks in this base. And so you just enter the log key on your calculator and then you enter 75 and then you close the parenthesis. Put the right parenthesis in there. So you just take log, just literally enter log of 75. And so when I do that on my calculator, uh, I get 1.875 approximately. So I get uh, <clears throat> log of 75 is approximately equal to 1.875. Right. That that's the number approximately that you raise 10 to get 75. Right. You can certainly check that on your calculator by taking 10 and raising it to the 1.875 power. Remember, that means take 10 and put a caret symbol and do 1.875 like that. So when I do that, <clears throat> I get 74.989, 74.989. And you know we rounded that decimal, uh, the 1.875. So we just get close to 75. So that, that uh, kind of verifies that we've got it correct right there. <clears throat> And then you can also do the natural log. So the natural log, let's say, of 500. Uh, this would be, this is a base E logarithm. So technically, this represents the power you raise E to get 500, right? And, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't know what that is, right? E to what power equals 500 is the question. But in your calculator, you, the keystrokes are simply hit the LN key and then uh, enter the exponent, which in this case would be 500, and then just close the parentheses off at the end. Right? So I enter the natural log key, I enter 500 on my calculator, close the parentheses off, and I get 6.2146 approximately. So I get the natural log of 500 is equal to approximately uh, 6.2146, the four decimal places. So that's approximately the power you would raise E to get 500 as the answer. <clears throat> now the question, so your calculator only speaks in those bases, but the question is then how do you evaluate a logarithm like this? Like let's say we have the logarithm base six of 100. Now this is a base six logarithm and your calculator does not speak in base 6 it only speaks in base 10 and in base e. This is the power you raise 6 to get 100, but I don't know what that is. Right? I mean, I could maybe approximate it in my head. If I looked at a graph, I could do a better job with it, but we want to actually evaluate this. So how do we use our calculator for this? How do we use a calculator? And so this is the prop. This is where we bring in a new property here, and this is called the change of change of base property. The change of base property goes like this: that if you have logarithm, whoops, uh, logarithm base a of x, that you can change that to logarithm base b of x divided by logarithm uh, base B of A. <clears throat> uh, notice what we're doing here is we're changing a base A logarithm to a base to two base B logarithms. So in other words, it allows us to change the base on the logarithm. And so in our problem, which was uh, what log base six of one hundred. This is a base on the logarithm that I, my calculator does not speak in, and so I can change it to a base that my calculator does speak in. So, for example, I can change it to a base 10 logarithm and write this as log of 100 divided by log of 6. Or I could change it to a base e logarithm, natural log of 100 divided by the natural log of 6. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the exact same value either way. It doesn't matter which one you use. So if I take log of 100 and divide it by log of 6, and by the way, on my calculator, then this is exactly what I'm entering. I'm entering log 
100. I close those parentheses. I put a division, and then I enter log 6, close those parentheses like that. So when I enter that, I get about 2.57. About 2.57. And so that would be the, uh, the exponent you raise 6 to get 100. Right? You could check that. 6 to the 2.57. Uh, you, could, you could actually look at that on your calculator using the caret symbol. And I get about 99.96. Pretty darn close, whoop, 99, 99.96, pretty darn close to 100. And we just rounded that decimal, so that makes sense. So this is, a, this is an important property, especially when you're talking about calculator usage. Um, so we want to put a box around that, and that's a change of base property. <clears throat> All right, and then the, the last three properties we want to talk about today uh, about logarithms are very common to use when you're applying logarithms in different situations when you're solving equations are called, and I'm going to write them all three down, um, and so these are simplifying properties, simplifying properties for logs. And there are three of them. One, the first one is called the power rule or the power law, for, uh, or power property. <clears throat> and this property goes like this, that if you have logarithm base b of x raised to the a power, right, you're taking the log of x raised to the a power right there, that you can rewrite this as a multiplication problem where the exponent on that x is a factor. This is just logarithm base a times logarithm base b of x. Right, so that's a very handy property, definitely a very handy property to use for logarithms. That if you have the log of something raised to a power, you can actually eliminate that power. Um, so I, I'm actually going to write all three properties down, and then we're going to go back and look at all of them. The product property, and by the way, all these properties go along very much with rules of exponents, like the power property. Um, that goes along with this property of exponents, that when you have x to the a raised to the b, when you have a power that's raised to a power like that, then that is raised to a power again, what do you do with the exponents? You multiply them, right? That's a, x to the a times b. Well, that's what this property is kind of connected to, because remember, a logarithm is an exponent. And so what have you got? you got something, an exponent that's raised to another power. So what do you do? You write it as a multiplication problem. We're multiplying the powers together. That's exactly what we're doing. The product rule uh, applies when you have a log of a product, log of a multiplication problem. And this states that if you have a log of a multiplication problem, that you can rewrite that as the addition, uh, addition of two logarithms. It's log of x plus the log of y. <clears throat> That goes along with this property for lo for exponents. Remember, logarithms are just exponents, so they should they should uh, uh, the property should go along with those. And so, what happens when you take two x, uh, x's raised to a power and you multiply them together? What do you do with the exponents? You add them. Well, that's exactly what we're doing here. Notice is we're adding the exponents. We have a logarithm plus a logarithm at the end. So this property goes very much along with that one. And then finally, we have the quotient rule, or quotient property for logarithms, that says if you have a log of a division problem, log of x divided by y, then you subtract the logarithms. This is log base b of x minus log base b of y. And that property goes along with this rule of exponents, right? That what happens when you divide two expressions raised to a power like that? What do you do with the exponents? Well, you subtract them. Well, that's what I've got here. I've got the log of the division problem here. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to uh, subtract the exponents. Remember, logarithms are just exponents. <clears throat> so it goes along with that property right there. All right, so let's start looking at some of these properties. So uh, and that's what we're going to spend the rest of today doing, is just looking at some examples of these properties. 
So if we have log uh, base 3 of 3 to the fifth power. Now you there's a the this is inverse cancellation actually, but uh, if you wanted to, you could look at this alternatively like this that you could that five is an exponent there, and that that power rule at the top says I can take that exponent and bring it down in front of the logarithm like this. So that's five times log base three of three, and then log base three of three. That's the power you raise 3 to get 3. That's just 1. And so that's just 5 times 1, or 5. Now, if you'd been paying attention, you could have gotten to 5 directly on that one also, uh, because that is inverse cancellation, because the base on the logarithm and the base on the exponential expression are the same, then that means they kind of cancel each other out, and you're just left with the exponent. So it's really inverse cancellation also. But if you forgot inverse cancellation, you could get around it with the power rule. Uh, log base 2 of x plus 3 to the fourth power. <clears throat> right, so this, lo this power rule says that I could rewrite this uh, problem as a multiplication problem, that this is 4 times logarithm base 2 of x plus 3. Right? That's, that's what the power rule says I can do, is I can get rid of those exponents like that. And write it as the, the log of a simpler expression, which is sometimes nice to be able to do. <clears throat> All right, uh, if we had uh, log of um, the square root of z plus 4. Now, this is a base 10 logarithm. That does not matter at all. Notice that the, those properties at the top, it, those are true for any base logarithm. So no big deal here. Uh, this is technically then the log of z plus 4 to the 1 half power, like that. And so what can I do? I can bring that 1 half down in front as a factor and write this as 1 half times uh, log of z plus 4, like that. And we can rewrite it as a multiplication problem. The natural log of... Um, 1 over x, natural log of 1 over x. Well, I can rewrite this as a power, because 1 over x, remember, is really x to the negative 1 power. And so what can I do? I can bring that exponent of negative 1 in front and write this as negative 1 times the natural log of x, like that. Right? And write it as a multiplication problem. And so a lot of times you won't even see the negative 1 written. You'll say a negative natural log of x written like that. So natural log of 1 over x and negative natural log of x are actually the exact same thing. All right, um, <clears throat> so let's continue on with these properties. So uh, the uh, next property, to, to the product and quotient rules, we're going to kind of tackle those at the same time. So if you have uh, the natural log of, um, let's say, uh, just 3x, the natural log of 3x, then use, this is a log of a, of a multiplication problem, the log of a product. And so I could rewrite this as the natural log of 3 plus the natural log of x, that those are the exact same expression. <clears throat> All right, you have the log of 10y squared. Log of 10y squared. So that's the log of a multiplication problem, first of all. So I can rewrite that as an addition problem, the log of 10 plus the log of y squared. And then this expression actually simplifies again because the log of 10, remember that's logarithm base 10, and so that's the power you raise 10 to get 10. Log of 10 is 1. And then logarithm of y squared, and I'll put the parentheses around the y squared there, uh, that would be a power rule problem. I can bring the exponent down in front and write that as y, 1 plus 2 log of y. Now, I can't add the 1 and the 2 together because the 2 is multiplied by the logarithm. So I'm just stuck with it like that, but that does give you as simple a logarithm expression as you can get. All right, um, next problem, log base 3 of x cubed over y to the fifth. And again, it doesn't matter that it's logarithm base 3 here at all. 
um, the, these properties are true no matter what base logarithm you've got. So the first thing is uh, that this is logarithm of a division problem. And so the quotient rule says I can rewrite this as a subtraction problem, the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. Let's, let's go ahead and put parentheses around those expressions that we're taking the log of, like that. So logarithm base 3 of x cubed minus logarithm base 3 of y to the fifth. <clears throat> and then I can use the uh, power rules to bring those exponents down in front as factors. So you have 3 times log base 3 of x minus uh, 5 times log base 3 of y, like so. <clears throat> By the way, what we're doing here, a lot of times you'll see the word expand when you're looking at uh, problems like this where you're starting with a single logarithm and you're ending up with a, a several logarithms at the end. So sometimes this is called expanding. And what we're trying to do is rewrite these so that what we, the logarithms we're left with at the end of the problem are as simple as we can get them to be. Uh, and, and so we're trying to get logs of as simple expressions as we can get at the end when we're expanding like this. <clears throat> All right. Uh, last one like this. Let's say we have the natural log of x squared y cubed over the square root of z. Kind of a, a crazy problem right there, but we can do this. And so this would be, uh, first of all, it's the log of a division problem, right? You might see parentheses around that whole thing like that, which is probably a good idea to write it like that. So this would be the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. Now that denominator, that square root of z, is really z to the one-half, so I'm going to write it that way. <clears throat> and then in the first term, that's the log of a multiplication problem. So that would be the natural log of x squared plus the natural log of y cubed, because it's an addition problem there, because right? it's a log of a multiplication problem. It means you're adding two logarithms. And then uh, minus this natural log of z to the 1 half, like that. And then finally, on each one of those terms, I could use the power rule, and this is what I end up with. Now, the, the idea here when you're expanding like this is that the logarithms that you end up with are as simple as you can get them to be. And that's what I've got here. I can't make these any simpler than I've got them. Uh, and so, so that's, what you're, that's what you're trying to do when you expand the logarithm. Now, uh, sometimes we don't expand. Instead, we kind of take several logarithms and we try to combine them. And so you might see the word condense or combine, or contract. You see all of those words sometimes used in textbooks and in videos when you're starting with several logarithms and you're trying to combine them. So for example, log of 5 plus log of 8. Just a simple addition problem between two logarithms with the same base. <clears throat> because it's an addition problem, right? This is a product rule problem because it's his addition. And so this says, I, that, that rule says I can rewrite this as log of 5 times 8. And so this would be the log of 40. Uh, let me put parentheses around it so it looks better. There, log of 40. You could certainly use your calculator to evaluate that if you wanted to, but uh, that's actually not what we're trying to do here. We're just condensing these is all we're doing. Uh, log of 75 minus the log of 25. First of all, that is not, it's absolutely not equal to the log of 50. You can't subtract logarithms like that. How do you subtract logarithms? Just like the first problem is not the log of 13, right? You don't add logarithms, but it's adding those two numbers. You add logarithms using the product rule. You subtract log logarithms using the quotient rule. Right, so this would be the log of 75 over 25, or the log of 3. Right, log of 75 minus log of 25 is the log of 3. 
Those are the same expression. <clears throat> All right, let's say we have uh, 6 log of x plus 3 log of y. Now, uh, you can't use the product rule to add these yet because it's not a logarithm plus a logarithm. It's, it's 6 times a logarithm plus 3 times a logarithm, so that's not a good situation. So we first use the power rule here uh, before we do anything else. Then we, can, then we can add or subtract. So this is log of x to the sixth plus log of y to the third. See, now it's a logarithm plus a logarithm. And now I can add these together by using the product rule. Right? And so that would be the log of x to the sixth times y cubed, like that. Right, and remember, we're using the product rule in this case because it's an addition problem of two logarithms. <clears throat> now, these properties, believe it or not, can be very useful when we're talking about solving equations that involve, um, involve logarithm expressions. That's why we're trying to do this. So. All right. Um, let's see. Let's look at probably one more problem, and then that will kind of finish up our discussion for the day here. So uh, let's say we have uh, natural log of x plus 5 plus natural log of x uh, minus 3 natural log of x minus 2. Right, these are all natural logs. That doesn't matter. Now, first thing I would do if I were you is I would... Uh, use the power rule wherever it, it can be used and get rid of those factors at the end or at the beginning of each logarithm. So there is one place I can do that and that's in that last term I can bring up the 3 as a power and so you have the natural log of x minus 2 cubed there at the end. <clears throat> and then what are we going to do? We're going to take these two logarithms and add them using the product rule. And so this is the natural log of x times x plus 5, and then minus the natural log of x minus 2 cubed. And I'm going to go ahead and put brackets around the whole thing. You can multiply that out or not multiply that out. That doesn't matter at this point. And then finally, so that was the product rule. And then, um, and then what can I do here? I can uh, subtract these two logarithms using the quotient rule. And so using the quotient rule, this would be the natural log of x times x plus 5 divided by x minus 2 cubed. And I'm going to put brackets around the whole thing. Uh, and a common mistake here on this kind of problem is to write this as logarithm uh, divided by a logarithm. Right? That's not what the quotient rule says. Right? The, the quotient rule does not say it's a the logarithm that that if you subtract two logarithms, that that's a logarithm divided by a logarithm. What does it say? It says it's a logarithm of a division problem. That's what we've got right here. All right, so be careful to not commit that that uh, mistake. That's a common mistake to make, definitely. So, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so uh, some problems to look at for homework, textbook homework, to finish up our discussion today. Uh, so textbook homework that would be good to look at would be uh, pro on page 513 of your book to kind of finish up stuff about uh, asymptotes and, and uh, domains for logarithms, uh, page 513, 17, 19, and uh, 21 would be good problems to look at there. And then finally on section 6.5, this was the main, our main issue for the day today. This is page 525. Um, uh, you should probably look at problems uh, 3 through, let's see, 3 through 29 odd. 3 through 29 odd would probably be good ones to use. And actually, then also 33 and 35.
those would all be good problems to look at. All right, uh, so next time we're looking at the equations that involve exponential and logarithm uh, expressions. So uh, you guys who've been listening live are, have been quiet. So I'm kind of assuming no questions from you guys. Is that true? Okay, I guess that's true. So I'm good over here. Professor. Okay, all right. Thank you, Doug and Dominique. Um, so you guys have a great day, uh, and um, remember to uh, start working on your web assigned homework. Uh, request a, a a graded copy of your exam back by email if that's what you if you want that sent back to you. Have a great day and a great week, and I will talk to everyone. Remember also, by the way, I have online office hours. I forgot to mention that uh, tonight. Um, and also tomorrow from 11 to noon. So don't hesitate to come by my online office hours. And then again, Sunday night from 7.30 to 9. So um, otherwise, if I don't see you at the, any of those online office hours, I'll talk to you Monday morning with, uh, at our next lecture. Have a great week.